Thank you for that song, worship. You uh, clearly knew I needed that. So I'm going to start off maybe a little bit unorthodoxly, in an unorthodox way. I'm going to start off by apologizing. Two apologies. One, I'm feeling a little extra phlegmy. Not sure if it's the pollen, or not pollen, but allergies or what have you. Praise God for the weather that we had, right? It's amazing. You go all winter... And I think it's been a little bit drier this year, but it's been, you know, dark. And you have days like that, and it's just like, wow. We got to be outside yesterday doing some, some chores, and it felt good to, to actually be sweating again when you're not inside. The second one is, there's going to be a lot of scripture this morning. Not apologizing for that, but maybe the speed in which, or the challenge in trying to find it in your own Bible, it's going to be a little bit of a challenge. But as usual, it's going to be up on the screen. And if anybody wants the, the body of scripture that I'm going to be going through this morning for your personal study, I'd be happy to share it with you and just come find me afterwards and we'll make sure to connect in that way. If you remember, if you are here last week, PJ started off by asking a couple of questions. The first question was, what kind of church do you want to create? And he contrasted that with a more passive view of what kind of church do you want to attend or what kind of church are you trying to find? And I left wrestling with it, with those two questions. Do I want to come... On a Sunday morning, listen to a message, warm a, warm a seat, warm a pew, I almost said, sing a few songs, and leave with this emotional sense of feeling good about myself? Or do I want to come to where there's a, a vibrant, gospel-centered church where I get to actively participate, where I'm not just warming a pew or warming a, a seat and singing the songs, but I come expectantly, and I, and I shared this a little, or I heard from a few of you this morning, that you're coming expecting to hear from the Holy Spirit today. Not from this knucklehead, but from the Holy Spirit. Is that the type of church that you want to help create and foster where you're engaged, where you're actively, actively participating? In point one this morning, it's kind of a follow-up question to what I was wrestling with, is what kind of, what kind of Christian do you want to be known for? What, what is your legacy? What do you want your legacy to be? That's something for you to note to wrestle with later. Now, as I transition to talking about our text this morning, you're going to notice that the bulk of our time is going to be spent talking about training, specifically training for godliness, training for godliness. Now, most of us have experienced some kind of job-specific training if you're in the workforce. Could be a, a, a plethora of things you could have experienced in the job, in the job force or the various tasks. If you have ever been a part of a sports team and you've been shown how to do a drill or play a position, You've been trained. Maybe you've gleaned some, some information from literature for a do-it-yourself project or for a hobby, or maybe you're making a repair at the house. That's a form of training, too. You've ever been in schooling. That's training as well. This may be a new one for some of you. If you've been a husband for any length of time, you've been trained. <laughs> Otis almost be beat me to that. Good job, Sherry. So another question for us to consider this morning, I mentioned already, is what does your training for godliness look like? What does your training for godliness look like? We're going to dive into that deeper in a little bit, but before we dive into the text, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that we have the freedom to be here. We thank you for blessing us with this body. We thank you so much for the rich text that you have for us today, as well as the, your Bible in its entirety. I pray, Lord, that you, are, you prepare our hearts and minds to receive what you have for us individually today. May you challenge us in our areas of weakness, challenge us in our areas of excuse, and help us to move forward to not just be legalistic or check off boxes, but to truly desire and to grow to be more like you. It's in your name we pray. Amen. All right, so let's look at our text this morning in 1 Timothy 4, and we'll be reading verses 6 to 16, continuing where PJ left off last week. All right, verse 6. If you put these things before the brothers, you will be a good servant of Christ Jesus, being trained in the words of the faith and of the good doctrine that you have followed. Have nothing to do with irreverent, silly myths. Rather, train yourselves for godliness. For while bodily training is of some value, godliness is of value in every way as it holds promise for the present life and also for the life to come. The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance, for to this end we toil and strive, because we have our hope set on the living God, 
who is the Savior of all people, especially those who believe. Command to teach these things. Let no one despise you for your youth, but set the believers an example in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, in purity. Until I come, devote yourself to the public reading of Scripture, to exhortation, to teaching. Do not neglect the gift you have, which was given you by prophecy when the council of elders laid their hands on you. Practice these things, immerse yourself in them, so that all may see your progress. Keep a close watch on yourself and the teaching. Persist in this, for by doing so, you will save both yourself and your hearers. Paul starts off with if. If you put these things before the brothers. And I've often thought that those two letters, I and F, to form if, is an impactful two-letter word. It reminds me of 1 John 1, 8 to 10. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. If is an impactful two-letter word, right? Now, just like the rest of Scripture, if you read that too quickly, we're at risk of missing something. We're at risk of missing that it requires us. It requires us to do some work. Now, some of you, this may be a new concept, or others, you might be groaning at the fact that I just said there's work to do on our Christian walk. But let's see what Scripture has to say about that. Philippians 2.12, Paul said, Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Now, I'm not a Greek, scho- a Greek scholar. I think I just like saying the words. The Greek verb katergadzumai, or work out, means to continually work to bring something to completion or fruition. I'll say it again. Katergadzumai. It's just a fun word to say. If I'm saying it right. Forgive me if I'm not. (laughs) All right, so continue on in verse 6. Paul said, if you put these things before the brothers. Now, Paul, I believe, is talking about the preceding verses that PJ preached on last week, and he unpacked them for us. And I'm going to quickly paraphrase paraphrase what Paul was saying there. Some will abandon their faith. Some will devote themselves to deceitful spirits and the teaching of demons, the insincerity of liars, forbidding marriages, abstinence from foods that God created and meant for good. Everything that God created is good and made holy by the word of God and prayer. Those verses are warning us. They're warning us against false teachings, which we need to be on guard for all the time. And you can see some parallels from some of those verses, what we experience today. If you, if you put these things before the brothers, you will be a good servant of Christ Jesus. Good servant, or your translation, may include the word minister. It's taken from the Greek word diakonos. The word means someone who is a servant or anyone who performs a service or an administrator. Diakonos, by the way, is the word, also the word for deacon. And you may remember that James spoke about this a couple weeks ago. The word diakonos reminds me of the parable that Jesus, that Jesus shared in Matthew 25, where it talked about the man going on a journey. He had three servants, and he gave them various talents, five, two, and one. And the, the, the servants that he gave five and two, they went out and they made money with the talents that he gave them. Well, when the master came back and they showed the master what they had done, he shared with them, well, well done, good and faithful servants. You have been faithful with a few things, I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. Do you remember that the other servant went out and just buried their talent? And they came back and they shared how they were afraid of how the master was going to respond. And that master called that servant wicked and lazy. Which one do you want to be? What do you want to be known for? There's another example of work that we need to do or action that we need to take. Paul goes on to say, being trained in the words of the faith and of the good doctrine you have followed. Scripture is not clear on when Timothy may have heard Paul speak for the first time when Paul came through on his first ministry. When Paul came through on his first missionary trip, it could have been during that time. A year or two later, when Paul came back through that area called Lystra, and if you're like me, I didn't know where that was. It's in modern day Turkey, or it was in modern day Turkey. So on Paul's second trip through there, he'd heard about this young man that was spoken very highly. And Paul wanted to take this young man with him. That young man was Timothy. As recorded in Acts 16.4, 
It says they went on their way through the cities. They delivered to them for observance the decisions that had been reached by the apostles and elders who were in Jerusalem. So as Timothy traveled with Paul throughout the region, he was being trained in the words of faith and of good doctrine. We come to point two, another question. Should we entertain irreverent or silly myths? Why or why not? Let's see what scripture has to say. It tells us plainly in verse 7, have nothing, have nothing to do with irreverent silly myths. Now what are they? In essence, they are meaningless, trivial sayings that could have other religions mixed in with true Christian theology. We might see certain aspects of psychology mixed in and wrongly promoted to be biblical. Myths share similarities to false teaching. I believe Paul is writing about here are sayings that are mixed in with true doctrine. They are man-made phrases that are often believed to be part of the truth. There are also things or sayings that many people believe or maybe may even think they're biblical, but not found in the Bible at all. Here's a list of some silly myths or old wives' tales that might be ones that you've heard. God only helps those who help themselves. God only helps those who help themselves. This statement is actually, actually anti-gospel. The act of self-reliance and self-righteousness or the attitude of trying harder and working better actually gets in the way of the work of God. Jesus saves those who dies to themselves. Matthew 16, 24 says, Then Jesus told his disciples, If anyone, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Here's another one. God just wants me to be happy. God just wants me to be happy. It's a common belief that God exists to be a personal genie. Personal genie waiting to give us our every wish. It's amazing how we will justify, possibly justify our sinful actions saying, God just wants me to be happy. Happiness is tied to feelings and emotions that are based on circumstances. How often do our circumstances stay the same? God wants us to be obedient to him, trust him, and know that everything that he does is for our good, even if it doesn't make us feel happy. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good, for those who are called according to his purpose, Romans 8, 28. Emphasis there is on his purpose. You can make God love you more by performing well. You can make God love you more by performing well. This is not true. God loves us first. His hold on us is more robust than our hold on him. And while our choices deeply matter, which we'll cover a little bit in a moment, but God's love is based on his goodness, not on ours. Ephesians 3, 17a through 19. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the Lord's people to grasp, to grasp, how wide, how long, how high, and how deep is the love of Christ. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. And how can you get God to love you more than that? Cleanliness is next to godliness. The people around you may appreciate you staying clean. I showered today, so it's okay. You can... But it's not in Scripture. Parents may have used this unbiblical statement to motivate their kids to clean their rooms. I'm not calling anybody out. However, I'd suggest using an actual biblical statement. Honor your father and your mother that your days may be long in the land the Lord your God has given you. Exodus 20, 12. Another one that you may have heard, God won't give you more than you can handle. And I've even heard of people giving that to individuals who have just gone through something very painful that's real for them. And, and I won't go any deeper, but actually all of life is more than we can handle, right? Now, I know there's ebbs and flows, but all of life is more than we can handle. The point of living in a fallen world is not for us to try really hard to carry our burdens, but rather to give it up and surrender to God, and that's what faith is all about. Everything is more than we can handle, but not more than Jesus can handle. For we do not want you to be unaware, brothers, of the affliction we experienced in Asia. For we were so utterly burned beyond our strength that we despaired of life itself. 2 Corinthians 1.8. But Jesus said in 11, Matthew 11, verse 28, Come to me, all who labor and are heavily laden, and I will give you rest. 
We all worship the same God as another one. Yes, there's only one true and living God. Know therefore today and lay it to your feet that the Lord is God in heaven above and on earth beneath. There is no other. Deuteronomy 4.39. However, there is one true and living God. And he only accepts worship that comes through Jesus Christ. Not through Muhammad, not through Buddha, not through Joseph Smith or some other means. And there is salvation in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven, no other name under heaven, given among men by which we must be saved. Acts 4.12. Bad things happen to good people. Often we place ourselves in the judgment seat of what is good and bad, or who is good and bad. The popular way is to make a judgment by comparison. By comparison. Bob is a good guy because he's not as bad as Sam. However, according to the Bible, we are all on equal footing. Because none of us is good, not one of us. Romans 3.10, as it is written, none is righteous, no, not one. We're all going to the same place when we die, you may have heard. There are two possible destinations when we pass. However, only those who are in Christ will be with him for eternity when we physically die. Jesus said to them, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. John 14.6. And by these short statements, we can easily see how unbiblical myths can creep in if we're not careful and we don't know the Bible all that well. At the end of the day, there's no life in these false concepts and myths. This is over and against truth, which the Apostle Paul ex explains takes work to filter out. Paul is so convinced that it's God's word which leads us into godliness. It's God's word which leads us into godliness and then in turn to everlasting life that he's willing to train hard every day to that end. The end of verse 7, Paul goes on to say, Rather train yourself for godliness, for while bodily training is of some value, godliness is of value in every way, as it holds promise for this present life, but also for a life to come. The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance, for to this end we toil and strive because we have a hope set on the living God, who is the Savior of all people, especially for those who believe. Now Paul is saying that we need to train ourselves to be godly. He's not saying neglect our bodies. And if we take a step back and we, we, we look at the audience that Paul is talking to, their main mode of transportation was their body. They usually walked somewhere. For some of us, when was the last time you walked very far anywhere? <laughs> now, some folks have a nice exercise routine, okay, or have hobbies to that end. But he's talking to an audience that they, they understood because they were physically active all the time. I don't want to mischaracterize or misrepresent Scripture, but I think if Paul was, was sharing this today, he would provide just a little bit more emphasis to also make sure we're moving our bodies. Not neglect training for godliness, but I think he would provide a little more emphasis. But here, when, when, when Paul was speaking there, he said, we need to not neglect our bodies, excuse me, but focus more on training for godliness. Don't make one more important than the other. Excuse me, don't make your body more important than godliness. Now the Greek word gumnatsu, gumnatsu, or to train, simply means to exercise or discipline yourself. Now the audience there understood because they were close to the Greeks and how the Greeks were really into physical prowess or physical fitness in the body, and so they understood what that word meant. So to train yourself for godliness, using that word, they got it. They, they, it made a connection. And point number three, how do I train for godliness? I think our first step is to approach the Lord in humble prayer. And I think we need to do it alone. I'm not saying there isn't value or importance in corporate prayer. I'm not saying there isn't value in praying with friends or family. That's not what I'm saying. But if we're asking God to show us how am I supposed to train for godliness or where am I at, is it needs to be alone, removing the distractions of the world, distractions of other people, and humbly come before him. Now, I don't know if Nate knew this or not beforehand, but he already shared from Psalm 32. Here in verse 6a, therefore let everyone who is godly offer prayer to you. In Charles Spurgeon's response to that prayer, or that psalm, is, is this. In some of its, it's not, it's not its entirety, okay, it's been kind of Condensed. The man whose communion with God is constant, whoso earnest prayers used, <clears throat> excuse me, and brings every petition to the mercy seat, 
the man who could not live without his God, to whom God is his exceeding joy, the help and health of his countenance, the man who dwells in God, this is the godly man. We should start our training for godliness by turning to our Lord in prayer. That's our step one. Our next step is found in 2 Timothy 3, verses 16 and 17. All scripture is God-breathed and useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. So if you're asking, how do I train myself to be godly? You should ask God for wisdom. If you're a new believer and after you've asked God for wisdom, you need to recognize that his divine power, his divine power has given you everything you need for godly living. Don't take my word for it. Let's look at 2 Peter 2, 3. His divine power has given us everything we need for godly life through our knowledge of him who has called us by his own glory and goodness. As I mentioned above, one way is by devoting ourselves to the word of God. Now, when you hear devoting, you might start going down the path of the number of hours or how much time or already starting to, to let excuses creep in. I want to challenge you to evaluate how are you spending your free time? What sort of entertainment you engaged in? How much time are you watching TV? What sort of videos are we watching? The literature you're reading that's not godly. Playing video games. I'm not saying those things aren't bad, but when we start trying to make excuses, how much time do we have and what are we spending our time on? We might be surprised to learn that we have sufficient time to be in God's Word. The Bible is equipped, excuse me, the Bible has the power to equip us with everything we need to live God pleasing lives. If, that two letter word, we will prayerfully read it every day, allowing the Holy Spirit to teach and to correct us, we'll be able to live the life of victory that Jesus died for us to have. You will never grow in godliness without a steady diet of God's word. Reading the Bible is pumping iron spiritually. Now, if you've endured my preaching before, thank you for coming back. But this is not a new assertion, okay? If you're not putting in dedicated action into growing in the knowledge and understanding of God's word, you're starving yourself and getting spiritually weaker. I mean, try this. Just eat today because you've digested some word. And I mean, physically eat your breakfast or your lunch. But don't eat again until next Sunday when you get into God's word again. And see how you feel physically. Or maybe try just eating when you're actually reading your Bible, you might find you read the Bible a little more. <laughs> Not trying to shame anybody, just wanting to just get those juices flowing. So ask yourself, what does a consumption of your scripture diet look like? If we fail to train ourselves in this way, we're at risk of living in doubt, confusion, and a mediocrity. Scripture says, but solid food is for the mature who by constant use have trained themselves to distinguish good from evil, Hebrews 5.14. With good and evil being so prevalent in today's society, how can we discern right from wrong if we're not using God's word? In many cases, I don't believe you can. That's why our spiritual progress and maturity depend, depend greatly on knowing and understanding God's word. The intake of good doctrine is, by the, me is the means by which we are trained into godliness. You can also train yourself to be godly through, our, through other spiritual disciplines which happens to be point four. I can see there might be more spiritual disciplines, but we're going to go through a list of them here. And there should be extra room if you want to write others that you're aware of. Self-discipline. Self-discipline is synonymous to self-control. The Bible says that God has given us a spirit of discipline and self-control, found in 2 Timothy 1.7. Worship is another discipline. Chronicles 1, or 1 Chronicles 16.23 in 25, but also verse 34 says, Sing to the Lord all the earth. Tell of his salvation from day to day. Declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous works among the peoples. For great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised, and he is to be feared above all gods. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. Amen. So evangelism. You might be going, oh, man. As a new believer, I made all kinds of excuses about evangelism. I can't do it, or whatever. Well, I don't have the gift of evangelism, but we're all called to share the good news. We're all called to be evangelists. 
And we can make all kinds of excuses, but let's listen to what the Bible says. Matthew 28, verses 18 to 20. It says we are commissioned to evangelize. Uh Uh-oh. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, okay, this is where he's looking to you. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. So he's told us what to do. And he's given us a promise that he's going to be there when we do it. We don't have any room to wiggle out of that one, folks. 1 Peter 3.15, But in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer for the, to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect. That scripture right there should, when you think about What do I want my legacy to be? What kind of Christian do I want to be known for? You might want to ask yourself, when was the last time somebody asked me for the reason for the hope that I have? If they haven't, you need to reevaluate your Christian walk, possibly. Silence and solitude. Okay, so we're going through a homiletics class that, that PJ's putting on, preaching class. And we've had to give a number of talks. We've shared our testimony. We've shared the gospel. We've shared a devotional. I got to preach to them this this message last week. One of the pieces of feedback that I got, because we get it on on everything, was we didn't didn't get a Jason story. So apparently, I I have a a reputation for sharing stories about Jason. So I do have one related to this, and, and it's regarding solitude and silence. So I enjoy hunting, and I enjoy hunting where there are no people, no trails, and you get in some pretty neat remote places. Now, I don't always, can't always find people to join me because they don't particularly care for that. Well, when that happens, I'm by myself. Well, as a fairly hard, closer to extrovert than introvert, I don't like being alone. There are times where I can come home and be alone for minutes, and I'm good. Other than that, I need to be around people, okay? So my, my wife's laughing because it's pretty true. I kind of follow around like a puppy sometimes. So thank you for still being here, by the way. Um, so in those situations, I'm struggling to be alone. I really am. But I've got a job to do there, and I push forward. And the, the longest that I've, I've ever gone was six days, and that's pretty, that's pretty hard for, for me. But during those times... I've never, never felt closer to God than in those times of solitude and silence. Now, I'm not saying that we have to go away for six days to experience that. But sometime in solitude, away from distractions, whatever they may be, in silence, you will feel the presence of the Lord that you can't feel in in, in other ways. Luke 5, 5, verse 16 says, Jesus often withdrew to lonely places, and prayed. Fasting. Did Jesus say, if you want to, or maybe when you think about it? No. Jesus said, when you fast. We need to ask ourselves, when was the last time we fasted on purpose? Another discipline is journaling. Psalm 119, 27. Make me understand the way of your precepts, and I will meditate on your wondrous works. And the last one I have this morning is serving. Romans 12.1, Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. Now, church, this Christian walk requires action from us. It requires more than showing up on Sunday morning and trying to pay attention to someone lecture you on reading your Bible more. But it actually requires that when we've read it, to actually do it. In fact, James, the brother of Jesus, points out the silliness, points out the silliness of understanding Scripture without applying it. James 1, verses 22 to 25 says, Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like someone who looks at his face in a mirror and after looking at himself goes away forgetting what they saw. But whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues in it, not forgetting what they have heard, 
but doing it, they will be blessed in what they do. Now, in summary, we've covered a lot of ground today, a lot of verses. In this text, Paul has painted a picture of the importance of godliness in the Christian life. This is where we need to go. And we're only going to get there if we pursue wisdom, make choices, make wise and discerning choices. The only way we'll ever be wise is if we know the will of God as revealed in Scripture. The point of training for godliness is to be more like Christ, not to just point off a list of Christian to-dos. If we're focusing on those to-dos and it's not pointing us back to Christ, we've missed it. And finally, we come to point five. Ask yourselves, what does my training for godliness look like now as I sit here today? What does it need to look like? And what am I going to do about it? Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for the grace that we often just take for granted. We thank you for the patience that you have for us that, again, I think we take for granted. We thank you for the unending love that you first loved us. Lord, as we navigate this Christian walk, I pray that we will not be a people content with our, our current situation, where we're at. If you've revealed that we have work to do or areas to grow, please help us to wrestle with that, especially <coughs> regarding our training for godliness. If we lack wisdom, may we earnestly seek it from you without hesitation. And also, Lord, I pray that if any of us are mired down with sin or caught in the grips of troubles of this world or excuses, may we not hesitate to give it up to you. Lord, finally, may we not be so caught up in what we are to do and boxes to check off, actions to take, and we miss out our pursuing to be just like Christ. May we make time to just be alone with you. In your name we pray, amen.